Thanks for joining us this afternoon. I'm Nancy Furness, and this is Tri-Cities Community Television. Um, before we get started today, I'd just like to acknowledge that our interview is taking place on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of Coquitlam First Nations. And we are very grateful uh, to the Coquitlam people who continue to live on these lands and to protect the lands and the waters and all that lies above and below. So today we are joined by James Bobbick, who is a horticulturalist and a founding member of Wondrous Tree Fellowship. So thank you so much for joining us today, James. Thanks for having me, Nancy. It's good to be here. Great. Um, I'm hoping that you can start us off by telling us a little bit about Wondrous Tree Fellowship, who the group is, and some of the things that, that you do. Sure, um, sure. Uh, well, I would, uh, I guess, best describe our group as a, as a, a small grassroots community-based group that shares a common goal in protecting trees and advocating for trees in our Tri-Cities communities and, and also celebrating trees. Um, you know, how we, we, we're, we're really blessed to have some amazing trees in our community. And I, I like to say that we advocate, we educate, and we celebrate trees. I like that. Um, yeah, yeah, it's kind of catchy. And, uh, and so, um, so we, we, we do all kinds of events. Um, Education-wise, we do tree walks. Um, we, do, we hold seminars where we can help educate the public on the value of, of trees in our urban environment. Uh, we do a lot of art, art uh, um, uh, uh, displays or uh, uh, art days with kids, for example. Mm. Um, Beyond Belief was one of, the, uh, uh, one of the days we had with kids who would uh, take different colored leaves, fall leaves with different colors and make shapes and designs out of them. And, uh, and in a way that helps kids learn about trees as well. Um, and then, of course, we do a lot of entertainment as well. We, we like to have a... a Is that a, the celebration part ce of the... The celebration mm -hmm. part. We like to en enjoy ourselves and celebrate yeah. the fact that we, we, we love our wonderful trees. And we do that in a number of ways. Of course, we annually we take part in the May Day Parade, the Rotary mm -hmm. Club puts on the May Day Parade in Port Coquitlam, and we always have uh, a walking group that enters into the parade. Uh, we, we have also in the past had a, um, an amazingly successful Jack Lantern Festival, mm -hmm. of course, at Halloween time, which drew, uh, I believe, it was somewhere close to 4,000 people wow. at uh, Lions Park. So um, those are some of the activities we do, uh, and we're always looking for more interesting ways to engage the public. Can you tell us a little bit about the tree walks? Where do you hold the tree walks? Well, the tree walks can be in a number of locations. We, uh, we, we now like to um, um, engage the public in all parts of the Tri-Cities. So one of our uh, special tree walks is actually on Earth Day, which is uh, April mm -hmm. 22nd, and that's at Rocky Point Park in Port Moody. And that particular tree walk, we look at the ecology of uh, our native plant species and a lot of our native trees that, uh, that are uh, growing in that area. So um, that's a really popular one. Uh, we'll also do mm -hmm. fall um, tree walks, so we'll look at fall leaf color displays. Um, and we've done those in Port Coquitlam and, and Coquitlam as well. So Great, so yeah. people can come out and join. Is there a charge or anything? You for know, well, that's, that's a really wonderful thing about our group as well. We, we don't charge anything to the public. We, we don't want there to be any limitations. Um, any barriers for people uh, to mm -hmm. join us and to learn so so we like to make them free um, it's sometimes challenging to raise the funds to do the projects we want but but we feel that's really important right now um, part of the goal of the group is to protect the trees and advocate for the trees and you were saying educate right um, what okay so for trees we Call, we're talking about the urban forest. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about what an urban forest is? Is it just the trees or is it something else? Right, right. So we're talking about um, urban forests. We're really talking about the trees that we live with. So, mm -hmm. so we, 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 think that we think about residential trees that are, um, that are uh, in people's yards that people have planted. Uh, we look at street trees that the city um, have planted, uh, our park trees. And of course these are native trees and non-native species as well. It incorporates all the trees that we could find in our urban environment within our city limits. Uh, as well as the understory. So understory plants, yeah. the ground covers are included with that because really it's all habitat and mm -hmm. it's really valuable habitat. So, so it incorporates all of those things. 
So um, should we be looking at planting only native species or you're talking about urban trees. Right. Is there value in having, um, you know, some exotic trees in there as yeah. well or some that aren't native to the area? Yeah, so, so the urban forest incorporates, uh, it also incorporates uh, um, um, areas of, of native forest. So we have mm -hmm. um, parks and, and, and parcels of land that still have native uh, indigenous uh, plants on there. So that in includes that. But of course, it's, it's pretty unrealistic to, to think that residents and cities are going to plant strictly native trees. So, right. so we have a really wide variety of trees that we grow in the city. And in some ways, that's a real big advantage because as we've seen with climate change and the effects yeah. of, of, uh, of warming climate, um, many of our native trees are really struggling. You know, you look at uh, our red cedars, um, our hemlocks that are dying off. And so when we look at replacing those trees and we look at moving forward with, uh, with um, um, you know, new plantings in our urban environments, we really do need to look at trees that might be considered exotic trees as well, but that may be um, a little bit uh, better adapted to mm -hmm. the changing climate that we're seeing. Well, we can maybe talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, when we talk about the urban forest, I've heard people say, you know, we're surrounded by trees, so we don't really need trees in the city specifically. Can right. you talk a little bit to that? Like, why do we need trees in the city as well as, you know, trees that are, are surrounding um, the urban areas? Right, right. That's a good question. Um, you know, we know that trees provide us with an incredible number of services that are really, really valuable and important to our urban environment. And although we, we certainly realize that trees in their native environment and forests are, are hugely important for biodiversity and, and for carbon sequestration as well. Um, but when you think of the value of trees in urban environments, you can magnify that by 10 times, you know? Um, you know, you look at the, um, the way that we can, they can cool our cities, um, that they can filter out air pollutants in our communities. Um, they can help um, reduce a stormwater runoff as well. So, um, and of course they provide us with, with clean air, with oxygen too, right? So, so they do so many services and that's really important to have them right here in our communities where we live and we, where we are every day. Well, I think you hit on a couple of really good points there. When we're looking at the effects of our changing climate, we're getting um, drier, hotter summers for sure. We've seen a heat dome effect just a couple of summers ago. That's right. And, uh, you know, would trees have helped mitigate that, the effect of that in the, in the city? Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the main things that trees really do for us. Um, they do cool our, our temperatures in the city. And, mm. uh, you know, you may be well aware, I know you are, of mm -hmm. uh, the term the urban heat island effect. Right. And, of course, that's when the radiation from the sun's rays heats up uh, artificial surfaces like roadways, uh, sidewalks, um, cars, buildings. Right rooftops, all these artificial um, human-made materials um, retain and absorb that heat from the sun and of course then they radiate that heat off throughout the day and right into the evening to the night. So what trees do, is they have a couple of ways of helping to mitigate that and one is just purely by the amount of shade that they cast. So right. blocking a, out those right, heat rays from the sun. Blocking out the harmful yes. rays. So a large canopy tree will just give you that shade that you need and actually stop the, uh, the rays from hitting the, the surfaces. Um, and of course, the other way and the more fascinating way that they help cool our city is by a term that they call evapotranspiration. And that is when uh, trees will actually absorb and, or take up water th through their roots mm -hmm. up to their trunks and actually right up to their leaves. And they will release that water through the leaves, through little, little tiny stomata in, in the leaf surface. Little openings, openings in the Openings, yeah, little yeah. pores in the leaf surface, just like we have pores in our skin. And they will release that as a very, very fine water vapor into the air. And uh, that, that vapor, that moisture coming into the air will actually cool the ambient air temperature, uh, much the same way as we will sweat when we're, we're very warm. So that actually has a cooling effect on our cities as well. So, 
so that's another way that trees help cool our, uh, our urban environment. Interesting. It's like nature's air conditioner. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So another point that you brought up was stormwater management. Right. Um, and when we're looking again, just recently, we can look at the atmospheric rivers. That's a new yeah. term that I know not everybody <laughs> likes, but um, we see these huge deluges of water coming in. And when we have cities where we've got a lot of impermeable surfaces. Right. Is there a place where trees could help maybe mitigate some of the surface flooding and, and things that we see like that? Yeah, absolutely. So that's, an, that's yet another service that trees provide. <clears throat> and they do that in a number of ways. And the primary way uh, is that when the rain falls, again, a large canopy tree is going to uh, sequester a lot of that moisture, a lot of that rain and will hold it on, the, on its leaves. So it'll slow down the rain um, so that it doesn't um, erode the soil and it doesn't run off straight into the drains. Mm -hmm. And it'll hang on to a lot of that uh, moisture and some of it will evaporate off the leaves. And then eventually some of it will just, will trickle down onto the, uh, onto the soil. But of course, underneath the trees, um, when you have the, the, the leaves, the, the compost that builds up on the surface of the soil and the roots themselves, they actually act like a big sponge mm -hmm. and they'll absorb a lot of the rainwater and holding it in check so that rainwater is no longer going to go straight down into the storm drains. Um, and another thing that <clears throat> trees will do is, is their roots. Um, you know that large trees were, are, are excellent at breaking up compacted mm -hmm. soil. And so as they break up and make these channels through the soil, um, that also allows the uh, water to permeate down through the soil into these, into these, these openings and these pockets. So, so they're very good at helping um, um, mitigate storm, storm water. Right, and it also it sort of forms like a reservoir because that water remains available for that tree after it dries up a little bit as well, yep, I suppose. That, yeah, that's right, that's right. And that, so that water in the soil then will be, of course, uh, used again by the tree and some of that to, will, will uh, if necessary, will be, as we mentioned, de evapo uh, transpired through the, through the mm -hmm. leaves. And I think we seem to be on a little bit talking about climate change and effects of climate change. And so can you talk a little bit about um, trees as a way to take up carbon out of the atmosphere? It's, right. Uh, how valuable is that? Well, and that's probably one of the primary uh, services that trees provide that we need the most. Uh, of course, as we know that we're producing far too much carbon dioxide uh, as mm -hmm. humans, um, and that is the uh, direct result of our uh, global warming, uh, or global warming is a direct result of that. Right. Um, and what trees do, of course, is uh, when you think about, you know, going back to your um, high school biology class, um, trees photosynthesize. So they, they take the uh, energy from the sun and they, they sequester carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and along with, with water, they convert that into sugars, of course, which the tree can use. Right. Um, and they give off oxygen, of oh, course, which, well, is, another bonus. which is a bonus for us. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but of course, while doing this, they take that carbon and they store it uh, in their branches and, of course, in the trunks of the trees, right. which is hugely important. So when we're looking at ways to try and uh, capture carbon out of the atmosphere, really trees have been doing this for millions of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, the more trees we have in our community, the more trees we have in our environment, the better off it's going to be for us, the more carbon we can sequester. And uh, of course, when you look at what, you know, when you look at a large tree, when you see a, a big beautiful oak tree in the park, you can look at that trunk and, and realize that about 50% of the total mass of that trunk is stored carbon. Mm, so it's a significant... So significant amount, yeah. Yes. yeah. And, and the largest of our street trees can actually absorb up to um, uh, 10 kilograms of carbon dioxide per year. So we see quite often um, in developments and things, trees coming down, but we are often get the message that it's okay because we're planting twice as many trees or we're going to take down this big tree but right. we're putting in two new trees. Yeah. Is, are, is there a difference there like the two little trees equal one big tree or what are your thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah well yeah there's, there's a big problem there and it's, um, it's good that, um, that cities are enforcing you know tree bylaws where you know we're replacing a tree that's taken out with with new trees that's really important. Um, however the problem arises when you're what kind of trees we're, we're removing. Mm -hmm. And when we remove a tree that's 40, 50, 60 years old, um, you have to realize that those trees are just reaching their prime. They're just, mm -hmm. they're just beginning to maximize those services that we just 
previously talked about. Right. So when you remove a tree like that that's been growing for 40, 50 years and replace them with, with two or even three small little trees, you know, we have a long time to wait before those trees ever reach the size, if they ever do, right. uh, reach the size where they're contributing the same uh, value to our, uh, to our communities as a large tree. So you're saying 50 or 60 years sometimes before you're back to where you were with that right. one big tree. Right, right. Hmm. I guess another area, and it's kind of switching gears a little bit, but trees just play such an important role in the environment and sort of a relationship between humans and trees. Can you talk a little bit about um, the effects of trees on, on mental health? Like I think during COVID, we mm -hmm. saw people yeah. and the need to get outside um, into right. the forest and under the trees. Can you talk a little bit about that? Right, that's a really good point. Um, you know, we, we, we've come out of, I guess, three years now since we've had the worst of our, uh, our, of our COVID um, outbreak. And during that time, you know, you can remember that we were all housebound for a long time. We, mm -hmm. we couldn't get out to see our friends, um, you know, and it caused a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety that people were feeling. And the one outlet that we really had, and I think the one sanctuary that we had, was our, our parks and our, our urban parks and our trees and our forests. And, and being able to, to get out and experience nature, um, to be, get out of your house and meet with friends, um, it was extremely important for our mental health. And it really put a spotlight on how important trees are in our communities. Um, you know, when, when we walk into a forest, we walk through a, a, a park that's got all kinds of big, you know, big canopy trees, you know, certain things happen to us, of course. You know, our stress levels are, are lessened right away. Our, um, our blood pressure, begins to go down. Um, the harmful hormones like, like cortisol mm -hmm. and adrenaline are reduced. Um, so these are all effects that trees have and nature has and, and it just makes us feel good. You know, we just feel better when we're around trees. Well, and I think there's studies out there saying that people, even in the cities, like a tree-lined street, um, if there's shops along a tree-lined street, that people will spend more time on those streets and will actually spend more money <laughs> yeah. because they like to be around those trees. Right, right. And that's another, that's yet another thing, uh, economic value of trees. And, and as, as a tree lover and a horticulturalist, I, I don't like to put a price on trees. Yes. But at the same time, we know that, that that's very true. You know, tree-lined streets of shopping areas, uh, people tend to stay longer. They come from longer distances mm -hmm. to shop in those areas. So it's a benefit to, um, to businesses, local businesses, if we have uh, a good tree canopy cover in that area. Um, and, and you can even uh, equate that with increased values on real estate. Uh, yes, areas where more affluent areas generally uh, have more that, big trees. That's right, yeah. and, uh, and especially with the changes we've seen in climate, you know, people are looking for neighborhoods that are, are really well treated. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you, know, you can look at um, as much as 10%, uh, three to 10% increase in your property values right. as well. So I think we've touched a little bit on the roles that trees play and how important they are. They're also facing a lot of pressures um, due to development. We know that we have a need for affordable housing and more housing. Um, during COVID, we saw the increased pressure of, of, you know, a higher population of people getting out and using those spaces. And then, of course, we have climate change. Is there something that people can do um, as individuals to help you know, to contribute to a healthy urban forest? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. That's, that's a good question. Um, and it's a very timely question because, you know, we're looking at a time when, when um, there are great stresses on our communities mm -hmm. now. And, uh, and one thing I want to point out too is that um, this is one of the challenges we have is, you know, we know that there's housing shortages in our communities. Right. We want to densify and bring more people in and try and find a way to lower the, the, the price of, of, of buying a property in a house. And Unfortunately, what often happens when, when those pressures are, are put on our urban forests, um, you know, for example, you could take a, um, a neighborhood that is maybe 50 to 60 years old. And of course, that's a prime time for a lot of developers and city right. planners to look at that neighborhood and say, well, it's time to rezone this area and, and maybe, you know, build condominiums or townhouses. Get a and bit of densification. Densification, utilize yeah. that, that property, uh, uh, that valuable property in a better way. But of course, what happens is all those trees that were originally planted by residences when they first moved in those 60 years ago, mm. of course, all those very trees, those big mature trees that we need so right. much in our communities. And so what often happens, of course, is those trees are just taken out um, because it's cheaper, it's easier. 
uh, to develop a property when you have no trees on that property. Um, so so that, that becomes a really big challenge um, for us. Mm -hmm. and, and this is where people can play a big role as well. The public can play an important role because, you know, because we need to speak out on what we want to see. Yes, of course, we need to have development in our cities, but we also need to retain those great big trees. And if we can be creative uh, on the way we develop and the way we plan our cities, you know, perhaps we can incorporate those large trees into developments rather than you know, looking at them as assets right. instead of liabilities. And the role for the public to play is to really, is to really get involved mm -hmm. and talk to your city councillors, you know, phone them, uh, email them, and say, hey, we want to retain these trees. They're important to us. Um, we want to see more trees planted on our streets. Um, and, and of course, you know, because really they're elected to serve the people. Right. And we can't forget that, that, you know, we have a lot of power there. Um, one of the other things people can do as well, of course, is they can join groups like the Wonders Tree Fellowship. And we always welcome uh, people in and uh, uh, to work with us. Um, groups like the Burke Mountain Naturalists, another fantastic group uh, that, that advocate uh, uh, for uh, ecology and uh, in our forests and, and all the rest. So, so, and in doing that, you know, you meet other people, you get to network with other people, mm -hmm. and you become part of a bigger movement to preserve and right. to... Uh, and to uh, save our, our trees. That's, I, you brought up a whole bunch of really good points there, and I, I think <laughs> I we, could, we could talk quite yeah. at length on, on a number of those. Right. Um, I think there are a couple of events coming up, and you had mentioned Burke Mountain Naturalists. So there's an event coming up on March 7th at Douglas College at 7 p.m. And it's Burke Mountain Naturalists in partnership with uh, Protect Coquitlam Urban Forest and Wondrous Tree Fellowship. And so that's maybe one of these events where you're talking about where people can come together and advocate for, for the trees. Um, did you, can you talk a little bit about um, urban forest management plans and um, are these important documents that we should be feeding into? Because right now, uh, all the Tri-Cities are in different stages of developing urban forest management plans. And the event that's going on at Douglas College on March 7th is bringing through experts in the public and hopefully city representatives together to talk about um, sort of best management practices and how we can work together to get the best urban forest management strategies for the Tri-Cities. So is... Um, can you talk just briefly about urban forest management strategies? Are these important documents or do they matter? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Th these are hugely important. And so every city will have an urban forestry management strategy or plan mm -hmm. that, they're, that they're working on. Um, and this is crucially important because, uh, because, you know, really the decisions that we make now and how we're going to use our land, our, 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 our uh, city land, our property, how, we go, how we're going to zone, mm -hmm. uh, how many trees we're going to plant, where we're going to plant them, you know, it's going to have effects that can last for generations. Right. So, so, so it's, it's really important that we get this right. And the type of um, evening that we're going to be having on March 7th um, is, is a perfect example of a way that the public can get involved and can uh, come in and are welcome to, uh, to hear some really fantastic speakers mm -hmm. that we have that are specialists in the field of, of urban forestry. And, um, and we also encourage, of course, um, um, city councillors to be coming to this event, as well as, uh, as arborists and city arborists and people working in the private industry that will be working on residential trees. Um, there's a lot to learn here. We've got some fantastic speakers uh, coming uh, out as well. And, uh, it, and it's a step in the right direction, and it's very timely because, uh, as you'd mentioned, uh, um, many of the Tri-Cities um, the cities in the tri within the tri cities are working on their plans right now, mm -hmm. uh, coming in spring. So it's a great opportunity for public input, and uh, I would encourage um, everyone out there to uh, to come and join us. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, and I think our time is almost drawing to a close here. I think we could talk for a lot longer on the subject of trees, but I want to thank you very much for coming and joining us today, James. Well, thank you, Nancy. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks very much. So thank you very much for joining us. And as we've just been talking about, there is a Tri-Cities Urban Forest Forum taking place on March 7th at 7 p.m. at Douglas College. And there will be some more information um, following this so that you can see exactly 
who the speakers are and, and when uh, the event is taking place. And just to conclude, as a, for a little bit of transparency, um, I'm also a member of Wondrous Tree Fellowship and Burke Mountain Naturalists, and I strongly encourage you to join us. Um, look, on, look up the Wondrous Tree Fellowship on Facebook, get in touch with Burke Mountain Naturalists, and get connected to the trees and to the rest of your community as well. So thank you so much for watching. Thank mm -hmm. you.